Election programs on KSPS are brought to you with the support of CenturyLink, keeping you connected to what matters most. CenturyLink, your link to what's next. Wildfire protection. Balancing conservation with support of resource industries like timber and agriculture. Managing trust lands for school funding. They're all the responsibilities of Washington's Commissioner of Public Lands. Candidates Hillary Franz and Steve McLaughlin explain why they want the job in this election 2016 special. And welcome to this KSPS election special. We're pleased to feature a debate tonight with the candidates running for Commissioner of Public Lands. I'm Teresa Lukens, moderator for tonight's proceedings. The Commissioner of Public Lands oversees the Washington Department of Natural Resources, which is responsible for environmental protection in the state of Washington. This is an open seat. Peter Goldmark, who currently serves as the Commissioner of Public Lands, decided he would not seek a third term. He has been in office since 2009. The candidates in this race are Democrat Hillary Franz and Republican Steve McLaughlin. Let's meet them now. Hillary Franz lives on Bainbridge Island in Kitsap County. She is a graduate of Smith College and Northeastern University Law School. As a private practice attorney, Hillary Franz specialized in land use and environmental law. She served on the Bainbridge Island City Council from 2008 to 2011. She is currently the executive director of the nonprofit FutureWise. Steve McLaughlin lives in the town of Seebeck in Kitsap County. He holds degrees in biology and public health from the University of Oregon. He also received a Master of Arts from the U.S. Naval War College. Steve McLaughlin served in the U.S. Navy for more than 25 years. He's been a defense contractor and FEMA incident management instructor for the past 10 years. Welcome to you both and thank you for being here. Thank you, Teresa. For this debate, the candidates have agreed to follow our debate rules. The reporter panel will ask the same question to both candidates or a panel member may direct a question just to one of the candidates. Reporter panel members may request a follow-up to an answer. Answers will be limited to one minute. Candidates will be allowed two rebuttals for the entire debate. Rebuttal length will be limited to 30 seconds. For this debate, the candidates will answer questions from Whitney Ward from Crem2 News and Jonathan Glover of the Spokesman Review. So let's begin. A coin flip determined that Mr. McLaughlin will have the opportunity to answer the first question. And we will begin with Whitney Ward. Uh, there are many here in Eastern Washington who believe that West Side politicians are catering solely to West Side interests. So how much time have you spent here in Eastern Washington and what have you done specifically to understand the needs of our farmers, our ranchers, our loggers, and the many others who use our public lands for their livelihood? Most of my uh, campaign was initiated in eastern Washington, uh, initially with getting uh, our arms around the problem of wildfire. But as the campaign grew and we learned more, we took a look at uh, grazing issues, we looked at agricultural leases, and we advanced the campaign uh, to be more inclusive than just fire in that regard. And so it's my view that most of the issues with um, um, DNR land use is really focused on our rural communities of Washington. And since um, you know most of Eastern Washington can be considered rural, that's where we focused a lot of our effort. We also focus a great deal of effort down our coastal counties. Uh, and for that, I have uh, received the endorsement of the entire Washington State Farm Bureau and Farm Bureau PAC with great support by a number of uh, cattle ranchers. Ms. Franz. Yes, thank you. So in my 20-year career, I've actually worked across the state in almost three-quarters of the counties of the state, and many of them being in eastern Washington. I've worked in Ferry County and spent time up there with Senator Danzel, understanding the challenges that community has and being able to fund basic infrastructure, as well as the context of agricultural needs, since so much of its economy is based on agriculture. I've worked in Spokane County and helping pass some of the significant transportation policies at the local level as well as the state level to help this city and this county, as well as also the context of protecting our farmlands. St. Kittitas County, worked in Kittitas County with the county commissioners there 
to address 100 years of over-appropriation of water. There wasn't enough water for fish and wildlife and not enough water for irrigation. Helped create the first public water bank in Washington State that now ensures their water for both users. In Benton County, I worked with the community of West Richland to be able to uh, protect key agricultural land there to ensure that it could be put back to use and be planted this year for grapes and next year and now we have long-term leases on DNR lands as well as private lands to help generate an agricultural economy in that community. Jonathan? I'd like to ask another question about, um, about fighting fires. Uh, so the cost of fighting fires in some counties far outweighed the fee landowners pay to fund state readiness to fight wildfires. So for instance, in Okanagan County, the assessment raised um, about $472,000 last year, but the cost of fighting fire efforts was $2.6 million. Um, should landowners be paying more? Ms. Franz. Yes, so we can't ignore that we are seeing ever-increasing wildfires. Uh, we have over 3 million acres in forests in poor health. The reality is it's going to take work and effort and funding at the state level for Department of Natural Resources, which has the largest uh, firefighting team in the state, as well as efforts at the local level. I think that it, we have to recognize that uh, every community is a bit different in its revenue base, that the ability to raise funds in western part of the state, given their economy is bouncing back at a level we don't necessarily see on the eastern part of the state, we have to be understanding of that. We need to work with the property owners and with the local government to see are there places we can be generating more revenues at the local level for fire, but we have to make sure that at the state level we're securing adequate funding from our state legislature because the impact to our natural resources here and forest fires in Washington State impacts the entire state at an economic level and at an environmental level. Mr. McLaughlin. One of the problems that we've had with wildfire, especially in Okanagan County, where air flows from you know, the southern southwest of the United States straight up through into Okanagan County, and it dries throughout the, the course of its travels northward, makes o the Okanagan and, and Chelan and Douglas counties uh, right in the middle of a, a climate-type issue for fire. Um, we can't blame, and, and I don't believe we should assess taxes to local residents on this. Um, I think that, you know, the real issue to get after is improving forest health in those timber counties along the eastern Cascades to ensure that when, we, when a wildfire does start, it can uh, be taken to the ground rather than in the crowns of trees where it's very explosive. And with that in mind, by you know, cleaning up our forests and creating those healthy forests, we can create jobs which may improve the tax base in these counties, which would help offset that cost of fire. Whitney. In 2014, hundreds of families lost their homes to the Carlton Complex wildfire. Many of them had the same complaint of DNR, that DNR crews sat idly by while their homes burned. Later, many of those crews said they were specifically told not to engage. Current Commissioner Peter Goldmark told me personally, it is not the responsibility of DNR firefighters to do structure protection. Do you support that? Or do you believe that firefighters should do everything they safely can to prevent loss and damage? First off, I, I have been trained in firefighting. I've fought fire. And I've trained about 2,000 incident responders in the state of Washington. And there are three priorities in the, in the FEMA model for incident management. The first is, is protection of life. The second is stabilization of the incident. And the third is, life, is uh, protection of property. Therefore, I disagree with that. In fact, we went out last summer uh, to help do a reconstruction in Okanagan and provide relief to people in eastern Washington. And we found one man who went and pleaded with DNR firefighters to save his home. They refused, he lost everything. I am completely against that model, and I will fix it when I get in because I know how to fix this, which makes me uniquely qualified in this race to work those types of fire management issues. Ms. Franz. Yes, I believe it's the responsibility of the state as well as everyone to do everything we can to make sure that we don't have the spread of fires. Okay, so that means we need to make sure that the state is collaborating, coordinating with the local fire departments and with property owners to do, once it passes one line, it has no boundaries, so it's gonna keep on going. We all need to be coming together and making sure that we're not drawing lines when it, because we can't do that with fire. So I will make sure that we work closely with the fire chiefs and the fire departments and with property owners so that we can be making sure that we're stabilizing and keeping people's homes and their lives 
safe. It's why I have in this race the sole endorsement of the Washington State Fire Chiefs and the Washington State Firefighters Council because I'm committed to taking a collaborative approach that is coordinated and that we can be more effective so our fires don't get larger and more out of control and not as catastrophic. But do you think it was the right call to say the firefighters should not engage or do you believe that they should no be my point more? was to say no i believe that we should make sure that we are stopping fire no matter where it is and working with our local fire departments and our property owners to make sure that happens jonathan um i'd actually like to follow up i think uh mclaughlin <laughs> you said that you you wanted to clean up forest fires i'm sorry forests now in preparation for fires and i think um miss franz you've, you've mentioned it as well uh i'm assuming what you mean is prescribed burns yeah i think it is it my turn for this question well, well, you I, go ahead and answer, and then okay, I'll answer. Sure. I have some. I have some more. If you are, if you do mean prescribed burns, uh, so during a period of budget cuts, uh, DNR suspended prescribed burns on state lands. Now, is, uh, should the agency be using prescribed burns as wildfire prevention tool? And if so, where would the money come from to increase the use of prescribed burns? Yeah. So, number one, we have three million acres of forests that are in poor health. It's why we're seeing larger, more catastrophic wildfires in 2014 and 2015. We need to take a proactive and a reactive approach. We talked about the reactive, making sure we were coordinating better with local fire districts and that we're making sure that we're working with the state legislature to secure funding to be able to better to put out fires. On the proactive side, we need to implement an active management of our forest, that we are doing prescribed burn, selective thinning, cleaning up that woody debris. The legislation that came out of the legislature this year by Representative Cole, uh, Joel Kretz, his leadership was huge in being able to start to make movement to be able to actually implement active management of our forests to get a handle on that. I support that. I believe we can find funding because we, you, with Representative Kretz's legislation, we now can show its productivity and its effectiveness. I support being able to work in the legislature, be on the ground, and explain that when we lose these resources, it hurts our economy, it hurts our environment, and it threatens public health and safety. And having worked in the legislature to secure the largest transportation package in Washington State history, I know how to get funding passed in Olympia. Mr. McLaughlin. So <clears throat> with respect to paying or how we're going to pay for prescribed burns, again, it is a matter of working with the legislature through the fire caucus, and I've already been engaging with uh, Representative Tom Dent, with uh, Representative Dye, Representative Short, and with uh, uh, Representative Kretz on this matter to start looking at ways that we can help pay for this. Now, prescribed burns help do a couple of things. A, of course, they remove uh, ground fuels. Secondly, uh, we need to, we will remove woody debris from this. And then the third element of, the, of this issue is uh, we need to go in and graze these lands because grasses that grow on the forest floor contribute to seasonal fuel load. And so one mechanism that we could use to help offset some of the costs may be money that comes from gra increased grazing leases and from contracts to forest workers to come in and, and uh, help with the, the, you know, the payment based, based on rates. Whitney. Uh, this is a candidate-specific question. Okay. So, Ms. Franz, uh, your past has been with the environmental groups. Your past work has been with those environmental groups. So how do you intend to strike a balance with your past while also representing the, uh, the needs of both eastern Washington and yeah. western Washington land users? Yeah. So I would actually say, well, I have um, obviously been uh, the executive director of an environmental organization and have a long background in environmental issues. I've actually, if you look back at my 20-year career, I have actually spent my career working uh, to bring diverse stakeholders together, business, labor, tribes, environmental organizations to be able to actually resolve some of our longest standing issues. Whether it's the issue of water and resource like in Kittitas County and being able to come up with that first idea of water bank uh, or whether it's solving farms versus fish in the Skagit County. Um, an example with the transportation package. I actually broke with the environmental community to say it is absolutely critical that we have critical transportation infrastructure resources coming to our local governments. As a former local government official, I understand how limited our resources are and see how our roads are failing and we need critical infrastructure investment. Um, I've worked in the community level in West Richland and in Benton County to be able to actually protect those farmland resources from being converted so that it became their new economic opportunity. The way I work is being on the ground, in the community, understanding those issues, and being able to resolve long-standing uh, problems by up. recognizing the diverse values and opportunities. Now, because that was a specific question for Ms. Franz, Mr. McLaughlin will have an opportunity letter to also answer a specific question. Whitney, do you have a second question I now? do. 
I do. Uh, please explain what is your most relevant experience that will allow you to balance and equally represent the very different needs of Eastern Washington versus Western Washington? In the, in the 15 years I've been back in Washington State, I've, I've lived about half my time on the, on the east side of the state and the other half back over on the west side of the state. So I understand both sides of the state. And I look at the issue because it's even broader than just east and west. I believe it is urban versus rural because there are many counties along the coast of Washington State and, and some even down the I-5 corridor that have many of the very same issues and problems that we see out here in eastern Washington. And I've come to that understanding over the past, you know, few years. You know, the issue, the biggest um, the group of folks with the, the biggest stake in what DNR does are our rural communities. Uh, because of agricultural leases, because of fire and grazing leases uh, as well. So I really think that we need to take a look at it in, in more the construct of urban versus rural, uh, and rural or urban being the beneficiary of many of our trust funds. All right. Thank Jonathan? You. Uh, so as you know, global warming has been a hot item in today's political climate. Uh, do you believe that human-caused global warming is real? Um, and what, if anything, should DNR be doing to prepare state trust lands for uh, changing climate? Mr. McLaughlin. Um, I think mankind and human activity does contribute to global warming. Uh, the degree to which is hard for any of us to determine, but I, I, I do believe that climate change and, and man-caused issues do apply to that. Now, the role of the Commissioner of Public Lands in helping to manage that is to take a hard look at what we can do to ensure good forest health, then also look at how, we, how can we sequester carbon in our forests and, and through other methods. And my idea of this is that we grow trees in the forest in heart, and at about the 70 to 80 year point, which is under our forest and fish law, harvest that timber and mill it into things that sequester carbon. The, the wood in this podium, 50% of this is sequestered carbon. So we can extend that period of time through healthy working forests and taking those wood products and putting them to good use as sequestered carbon. Thank you. Can you say the question one more time? Uh, so do you believe that human-caused global warming is real? And what, if anything, should DNR be doing to prepare straight, state trust lands for climate change? Yeah. So yes, I believe that it, climate change is caused by human behaviors and actions. Um, second, I truly believe that Department of Natural Resources has a huge opportunity and responsibility to be addressing climate change on two fronts. One, I believe how we manage and care for our public lands and waterways will truly determine how we mitigate and adapt to climate change. And that means on the adaption size, one, we have the opportunity to be growing greater food source and supply right here in Washington State, leveraging our one million plus acres of farmland. We can have to be recognizing that we're going to be more and more independent on our locally sourced food. And the same goes for our locally sourced wood product. Our forests are absolutely critical, not only being able to ensure a strong economy, but also they are a huge, huge asset when it comes to our environment and carbon sequestration and also capturing of water resource, which is only going to get more and more limited as we've seen two past years with the worst drought on record. That's on the adaption side. On the mitigation side, we have the opportunity to say no to dirty fossil fuels and yes to clean energy and putting wind and solar and biomass opportunities That's on France. our public lands. Your time is up. And Whitney. Uh, you both have mentioned the millions of acres in Washington of unhealthy forest land. So how do you propose balancing the environmental protection needs when the regulations of many of those same environmental groups often limit logging and prescribed burning? So first of all, I'm a third generation farmer and small forest landowner. And I understand very, very clearly the context of balancing. I truly believe we can't take care of people if we don't take care of place. And we can't take care of place if we don't take care of people. Forest health is a perfect example of that. When we are actually blocking off and locking off forests from actual active management of it, we've seen them go up in larger flames in wildfire context. That is bad for our economy, it's bad for our environment, and it threatens public lives and safety. I believe that our forests need to be actively managed and ensure that we have investment in economic infrastructure like mills and biomass facilities so that we are actually being able to clean up those forests 
and put it to product and make sure they also don't go up in flames. And part of what I plan on doing is actually putting somebody with economic development experience and natural resources in each one of our regional offices so our, they can work with local communities to be able to generate greater revenues off those lands, make sure we're not losing them to conversion and sprawl and development, and in that context also make sure that they're being healthy managed for the environment. So I'm going to ask you to repeat the question and also ask, ask for a rebuttal too. Uh, you both have mentioned the millions of acres of unhealthy forest land we have here in Washington. So how do you propose balancing the environmental protection needs of that land when the regulations of many of those environmental groups limits the logging and prescribed burning? Okay, so with respect to balance, we, we spent a lot of time uh, putting together a very strict set of rules and regulations under the forest and fish law. And the forest and fish law has brought what many call in the wood basket of the world peace to the woods because it creates habitat that will help endangered species, number one. And number two, it will help with water quality to make sure that our streams and water quality right down to the Puget Sound is taken care of. And, and with that in mind, one of the problems that, that I would like to see go away is the litigation that has occurred that has challenged this forest and fish law pretty much since its inception. We need to sit and work collaboratively to, to allow this to go to, you know, to allow this to work without continued challenges to litigation and, you know, from litigation. Now, Mr. McLaughlin, you've asked for rebuttal. Yes. So, Ms. Franz, I will allow you a 30-second rebuttal and then come back to you, Mr. McLaughlin. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I thought he was going to ask me a question for the rebuttal. Okay, I got it. Um, Unless you'd rather so, defer to no, just No, I mean, so specifically as a context, seconds. we ne definitely have state and federal laws, environmental laws, that we need to be following. It's our responsibility. And if anybody has recently obviously been watching the news today, uh, the state settled the horrific Oso landslide tragedy. 43 lives were lost as a result of that. That was about management of our force and how to manage it in a way that doesn't harm people's lives and obviously doesn't become a huge cost to taxpayers. I believe we need to ensure healthy management of our forests that doesn't come at the jeopardy of fish and wildlife habitat and at public lives. But it doesn't mean seconds. that it comes at the harm of the local economy and our logging opportunities. Thank you. For Mr. McLaughlin. So the, you know, the question I've got in terms of environmental regulations, in, in, in the 46th legislative district, um, my opponent is, is spent a, quite a bit of effort in talking about the need to decouple uh, timber harvest from our state trust mandate. And this, we already have I I incredibly tough uh, laws in place uh, that will protect our environment, and it will only, in my opinion, contribute to future uh, problems in our forests if we decouple that timber from the mandate. So now that was his question. And that was his rebuttal that I need to respond to, I believe. Uh, <laughs> Can I get a rule call on that? Because he just threw out an issue that hasn't been raised yet that I'd like okay, a chance to respond to. Okay, you may have to. 30 seconds. So he raised the context of decoupling. Let me say this. The number one priority of every citizen in Washington State is to make sure we have funding to provide a quality ed quality education for our kids. McCleary shows that we are failing to meet our paramount duty to fund our schools. About 6 to 8 percent of funding from public lands goes to capital construction. I truly believe that part of that funding must come from timber, absolutely. But given the context of greater wildfires and the challenges that we have with disease and insects, we have to diversify our funding revenues. That means clean energy opportunities. That means increasing agricultural revenues from our agricultural lands. That's my position on that. Thank you. And you have 30 seconds. Well, it. it you know, the problem that I see with this is that, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at lots of litigation against the forest and fish law and then being on record for saying that we are going to decouple that. I agree that we need to spend and our schools need money. And so at a time as critical of the, as this with the McCleary issue that is looming over all of us in the state, I think it's vitally important that we keep every revenue source open rather than consider excluding one from, that's, that's a big contributor. All right, this will be our last question from Jonathan. You'll have 30 seconds for your last question. I think this one is Mr. McLaughlin first, correct? Yes, it does. Okay, do you support Initiative 732, 
the ballot measure that would tax carbon emissions? And what do you say to critics who say it would unfairly increase costs of hardworking families? I do not support the initiative. And the reason I don't support the initiative is I believe there are far better ways to work on clean air, clean water, uh, and clean environment. And that is, you know, over the past 50 years, we've all moved in the direction to, uh, you know, to, to work towards that. It's, it's my view to go and work towards carbon sequestration and all work together on that um, and, and through education rather than tax uh, carbon use. Ms. Franz. So I do not support the initiative. I do support client regulating our greenhouse gas emissions. I don't uh, support that tool. And part of that is, is because it's projected to be revenue neutral when in fact uh, you look at the recent studies, it doesn't appear to be revenue neutral at all. In fact, it would only increase uh, our already existing revenue deficit. We have $600 million we're in the hole next year um, for the budget, and that doesn't even begin to start addressing McCleary and our limited funding. We need to be generating revenue so that we can actually not only ensure we're funding schools, but be able to start putting to vests in clean energy and renewable opportunities. All right, and that brings us to our uh, closing statements for this debate this evening. Uh, we did flip a coin before the debate, and we determined that, Mr. McLaughlin, you will go for first with your closing statements. Well, <clears throat> after living on the land and traveling throughout the world, I have seen that Washington State and the Pacific Northwest is indeed the finest place to live in on Earth. And, and I, I love it here. Um, because of that, it is my intention as your next Commissioner of Public Lands to ensure that we are preventing wildfire, we are actively attacking wildfire, and that we are tearing down the jurisdictional boundaries that fire has, because fire knows no boundary. Secondly, I believe in healthy working forests. This helps with our school trust mandate, and I will manage in an unbiased and non-prejudicial way of that trust, but I also believe that, that healthy forests create jobs in our rural communities. Finally, I will lead the Department of Natural Resources as a servant leader to help promote people from the bottom up into management positions rather than the top down in order to have a very robust and, and healthy workforce. All right. Ms. Franz. This race, can, we could not be more different. I am a third generation farmer and small forest landowner. I have over 20 years experience working across the state, specifically on the issues that Department of Natural Resources is responsible for, agriculture, forestry, and aquatics. I have also worked in almost three quarters of the county state specifically on those issues, being able to bring diverse stakeholders together to resolve some of our longstanding issues. I plan to come forward with key leadership, one that does not take us backwards on energy, that is supporting fossil fuels like coal, and is moving forward a clean energy plan where we can create jobs and reduce our dependency on dirty fuels and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I'm also a local, former local government official, and I have worked with local and state and federal agencies in my 20-year career to be part of the solution. I do not refer to the context of our federal state agencies, like my opponent has, in the context of referring to as bureaucratic terrorists, as well as the context of a war on rural America. I'm here to work with every community in the state and make sure we're doing that in partnership with local, state, and federal government. Thank you. And that will do it for this debate. Our thanks to candidates Hillary Franz and Steve McLaughlin. I would also like to thank our panel of journalists, Whitney Ward of Creme 2 News and Jonathan Glover from the Spokesman Review. The general election is November 8th. Ballots will be showing up very soon in your mailbox and must be postmarked by November 8th. In Spokane, you can drop them off at public libraries or at the STA Plaza in downtown Spokane. For all of us at KSPS, thank you for watching. I'm Teresa Lukens. Good night. Election programs on KSPS are brought to you with the support of CenturyLink, keeping you connected to what matters most. CenturyLink, your link to what's next.